really excited to finally share this video with you. Uh, it took me quite a while to get everything right, but I think you're going to be very happy with the end result. So you may be confused seeing a one hour video with the title simplified in it. Uh, don't be. Just to set your expectations clearly, this video has a lot of substance in it. It's not one of those cooking under three minutes videos. I'm going to cover pretty much all the aspects of project management, be it project lifecycle, process groups, knowledge areas, work breakdown structure, scheduling cost. So it's basically a 10 hour course condensed into one. So my mission with this mini course is to make project management very easy to understand for you. Because essentially, Project management is fun, but more importantly, it's very easy. It's not a profession on its own. It's not like accounting or auditing or even consulting. Project management is a complementary discipline that helps you run your projects very easily. As simple as that. And the best part is pretty much all professionals, you know, be it an accountant or a chemist, can benefit from it. So who is this video for? This video is for you if you want to learn how to manage your projects at work. So it's applicable to every single professional I can think of. I mean, I've never seen any professional in my 10 year management consulting career who hasn't run a project. It just so happens that sometimes they don't know they were managing projects, right? But they were projects indeed. So if you're looking for a simple enough framework to understand project management and implement it at work, then you're on the right place. By the end of this video, I'm confident that you'll be able to add project management as a skill in your resume. Also, this video is for you if you're preparing for your PMP exam or CAPM exam. Once you finish this mini course, the PMBOK guide uh, will be a lot easier to understand. See, the PMBOK guide uh, is over 500 pages long. It's a very, very long and quite boring book, I must say. So, um, obviously, I can't share everything in this short video that exists in PMBOK guide, but if you watch this video without skipping, the PMBOK guide, Project Management Body of Knowledge, uh, will be so easy to follow for you because it's all about understanding the fundamentals. Everything else just becomes very easy to follow. See, when I took my PMP exam, I think around six years ago now or five years ago, uh, I almost aced it. I scored one of the highest points at that time. And the only reason why I scored so high was not because I spent hundreds of hours studying. On the contrary, I just understood the fundamentals. And once you understand the building blocks, as I said earlier, everything else becomes so easy to follow. So I suggest you watch the entire video without skipping. But if you're interested in learning just certain elements only, then you can look at the description box for the index of the video. Good, so let's get started. I mean, what is even a project? It definitely has a sexy tone to it, right? Project. I wonder how it sounds in, in French, projet. So here's the definition. Project is a temporary endeavor to create a unique solution. Yeah, but that's operations. No, no. The difference between a project and operations is fairly simple. A project ends, so it's temporary. You implement your project, you close it, you create a unique product or service or whatever the outcome you wanted, then you're done. Whereas in operations, it's an ongoing uh, effort. It's re repetitive. So you may have also heard about the terms program and portfolio. Uh, let me just quickly explain them here as well. Program is multiple projects put together combined. And portfolio is similarly multiple programs put together. So it's basically project, uh, program, and then portfolio. Now, before I go further and dive deep, uh, you need to understand something very crucial. To run any project, you need two methodologies. The first one is a project life cycle. And the second one is project management process. Most people confuse these two. Okay. And if these are not clear, you can kiss that PMP certification goodbye. It's absolutely amazing how many content creators in YouTube or elsewhere confuse these two. They are not interchangeable. You cannot afford to confuse a project lifecycle with a project management process. But don't worry, I'm going to make it very, very simple for you. So let's start with the project lifecycle. Project lifecycle is unique to a project, to an industry, to your needs. It's highly customizable. Think of it like this. A human development is a project, isn't it? 
So your life cycle is uh, conceiving, birth, childhood, then uh, teenagehood. Teenagehood? Is that a word? Teenaging? Whatever. So um, adulthood and then death, right? Easy stuff, right? So now if it was an IT project, um, I'm not an IT, but it would probably look something like this. It would be high level design, high level design, then detailed design, then coding and testing, uh, installation, and then finally probably a turnover if it was done for a, for a uh, client. So this is project life cycle. And here is probably where the confusion comes from. The term cycle. That's what's confusing because after you die, you don't get to be conceived again and be born again. I think, but who knows? So, or once you hand over the product to the client, you don't get to be, you know, designing that again. So it's not actually a cycle. It's just a confusing term they use. It's sequential. It's a sequential steps of various phases of a project. And these phases, I'm going to repeat it again, are unique to your own project and your needs. So you create your own cycle. So a project life cycle may have one phase or multiple phases, like the examples I gave earlier. You know, there's no single way to define the ideal structure for a project. For example, one company may treat a feasibility study as first phase of a project. Another may treat that as a, uh, as a third phase of a project, and another may not even include it at all. It's custom made. I know I said this multiple times, custom made, and but I, but you'll soon understand why I had to repeat it multiple times. Just be patient. Just bear with me. Now let's talk about the second element that you need to run any project, and that's the project management process. Your process groups. See, if you're following PMI's project management body of knowledge, then your process groups aren't quite customizable. So you can customize the processes, but not really the groups. We're going to talk about that soon. So we have five process groups to learn here. We have initiation, we have planning, we have executing, then we have monitoring and controlling, and finally closing. These are kind of set in stone. I mean, you can't really play around with them that much. Now, here's where all the confusion arises. For those of you who are interested in taking a PMP test, I will now tell you the single, single biggest reason why most test takers fail. And it's all because of confusing this. This is what I'm about to share. So, ready? Okay, remember how we talked about that, um, the fact that project life cycle is highly customizable? You know, I bored you to that death with it. You know, customizable, customizable, customizable. So, now what we do in real life is for small projects, we really dumb things down. We simplify things. Instead of attaching process groups to every single phase of a project life cycle, you know, conceiving process groups, you know, like development process groups, you know, initiation, planning, execution, MNC, and closing, and then uh, death, you know, this. Instead of doing that, in real life, we just attach the process groups to a single phase project life cycle. Now, I hope this is clear. This makes things really, really easy to run the project for us. It's, it's less complication. I mean, why make things more complicated than they should be, right? There's so much paperwork involved, which you'll soon see. A lot of paperwork. So, your project life cycle isn't initiation, planning, execution, monitoring and closing, and monitoring and controlling and closing. If you don't get this right, I guarantee you that you will fail the exam. Now we're going to talk about the process groups and while I'm explaining that, I will also simultaneously run a project for you uh, to demonstrate how it works in real life. But before I get there, I want to share something very quickly with you. It's about PMP. If you're looking to get a PMP or CAPM degree so you can advance in your career and get better jobs, don't. Don't do that. It won't really help you as much as you think. Learn project management. It's awesome. It's an incredible field. It's an incredible uh, complementary practice. Everybody should learn project management. But don't you think that by getting a piece of paper, I have it here, 
like this uh, that you're going to or this uh, that you're going to advance in your career don't do that it's not going to work because every company has their own methodology and have their own uh, terminologies and frameworks you know instead of spending hundreds of hours and a lot of money on a certificate that you won't even use I suggest you check out my LIG program and let that program show you how you can achieve the career you deserve. It sounded a bit like an advertisement break, but it's not. Um, I'm very passionate about my LIG program and the results are overwhelmingly positive. So you can go to thecareermastery.com and you'll see a link to register to LIG um, if it is active by the time you're watching this. Uh, because as I said, most multinational firms have their own in-house methodology to follow. So you'll have to unlearn a lot of the things to learn their way. For example, my employer, PwC Consulting, has a complex methodology for every single work we deliver. Uh, it's the best in the world and miles better than PMI's framework or Prince2 methodology. So your future employer will have its own methodology as well. But still, don't confuse these two. Learn the fundamentals of project management. You know, learn everything I'll share in this video. Project management is awesome. It's an incredible practice, but a certificate, uh, nah, not so much. It's highly debatable. Okay, so let me continue. Oh, and one final point on this. Um, I have a pretty amazing bonus and a guarantee. So if you don't get the results or the jobs you want within 30 days, I will personally work with you free of charge to get you to where you need to be. Okay, now sorry for the break. I felt compelled to share that. Now. Let's start with the first process group, and that's initiation. To make things very grounded, um, I will use the construction of this boat as an example. <laughs> I hope you can see this. It is a huge, huge boat. So yeah, this is the boat um, I did, I think, last year. And I think it's going to be an awesome example to run this um, session with you. I mean, I could give you examples from my own work history. Obviously, as a manager at PwC Consulting, PricewaterhouseCoopers, I ran hundreds of projects. But it would create a few problems. One, I'm under strict client confidentiality agreements. And two, uh, we don't use PMI's framework. So I'm going to teach you PMI's framework here. So it won't really be very relevant. I think using this boat, uh, designing and manufacturing it uh, with all the paperwork involved um, it'll be awesome so for initiation process group you have two important processes the first process is that you develop a project charter and the second process is you identify stakeholders now let's start with project charter so project charter is a fairly simple document uh, outlining a few things it's like mini project plan very simple one though essentially you're finding an answer to why you're doing what you are doing so in my case if I have to develop a project charter for building this boat uh, it would include my objectives uh, scope rough idea for the cost and time if I want to uh, and then key stakeholders and key milestones that's pretty much it. At the initiation stage, you don't want the document to be very detailed. See, this is only like five, six slides. It's fairly simple. Um, speaking of later stages, uh, can you do me a favor? Uh, if you like the video so far, can you please subscribe to my channel? Because if you don't, YouTube will not show my future videos to you. So please do that. Let's continue. Um, in your case, your project charter Maybe as simple as explaining why you consider the expansion to foreign markets, right? Why you are considering building that new factory. I'll repeat once more. This is not the time to go into huge details. Talk about the business case and maybe high level project objectives and major deliverables and the roles and responsibilities. But um, don't go into too much details. Then you would ask, I mean, okay, then why do it? I mean, why do it? I mean, if it's not detailed, nor comprehensive, if it's just a couple pages, um, you know, it doesn't have much information. Why even waste time to prepare it? 
And if you ask that, it would be a very smart question. <laughs> the reason why we do that is to have a buy-in, to have the permission, because it's a checkpoint, right? You know, we want the support from the leadership to spend more time and maybe more money to properly plan it. I mean, as a principal, uh, are you, you know, my dear project sponsor, are you fine with me exploring this project a bit more? You know, can you sign off on this? It's a checkpoint. Your project sponsor may not want this project at all in the first place. You know, why waste time? You know, if they say no, you don't start planning. And my friends, planning is no easy task. Planning is difficult. So it's a great opportunity for the senior leadership to kill the project early on before you spend so much time planning it. Okay. Maybe they don't want to expand into that market. Maybe they have their own reasons. So they kill it off early on. But I want to open a deep note here and contradict myself a little. What you need to do or how much detail that goes into the charter uh, heavily depends on your project needs, project scale, your industry. So if a project is, as, is let's say, creating international space station. I mean, obviously your initiation will include a lot more details. You know, it'll be almost like high level planning. And the reason for that is because planning such a project, the International Space Station is over $10 billion, just the planning. So obviously it will require you to present a lot more information to your project sponsor to get an approval for a $10 billion planning, right? So far so good? Good. Let's move on. The second process for initiation process group is uh, stakeholder identification. At this stage, you will again keep it very simple. You will not categorize all the stakeholders based on their influence and the power. You will do that later. Now, as I mentioned before, we just want to know whether we should proceed or not. It's a checkpoint. So all you do is create an exile list and list down all the project stakeholders. And not this one. I'll just put it on the screen. So in my case, my stakeholders will be my wife. She'll be my sponsor, right? Um, then my neighbors, because I'll do a lot of hammering and drilling. So I'll make a lot of noise. Therefore, I need to include them as my stakeholders as well. For most projects, your primary stakeholder is your project sponsor. Who is your sponsor? Who gives you the go or no go, right? Who is the project manager? Are you the project manager? Who are going to be part of your project team? Who are going to be project management team, right? Project management team is different than project team, right? Now, now we have the project charter and the project stakeholder uh, register. It's now time to move on to planning. Of course, provided that you secure the approvals, you get that sign off, right? Now we have initiated the project and we got our approvals. Let's plan it. Planning is a lot more detailed and comprehensive than initiation. And we're going to need to talk about some, um, a lot of details and knowledge areas. So I'm going to introduce you to certain knowledge areas. So I suggest you take a break now, pause the video, go get a cup of coffee, refresh yourself and come back when you're ready. Or you can just bookmark this video and watch it whenever you're on top of your focus. Okay, Good. let's start. So with planning, we are looking to find answers to three main questions. Okay, so the first question is, what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? How to know when the project is done? This particular one is very important because in real life, most projects are never done. You know, they almost become operations. They're never done. So at the end of the planning process, you'll end up with a comprehensive project plan. And this project plan will include a few items. So it'll include the requirements, it'll include scope, uh, work breakdown structure, or as we call it, WBS, uh, we'll have schedule, uh, some, sort of, some sort of a timeline, uh, then we'll have cost and budget and quality. So for those PMP takers, let me put a disclaimer here. Uh, the PMBOK guide with its 500 pages of glory 
Uh, it has obviously a lot more knowledge areas, uh, but I'm simplifying things for you here. So if you plan on taking the PMP test, just make sure you properly read this whole thing, okay? Because all I'm trying to do is simplifying things and make you understand the fundamentals. So when you read this, you, you'll, you'll be able to understand it very clearly. But just keep this in mind. I am leaving a few things out. Um, because this video isn't only for PMP takers, but for anyone who just wants to learn the fundamentals of project management. Good, so let's get going. The first process we have is collecting requirements, understanding what stakeholders want. What do they really want? I mean, uh, we wrote this in the project charter, right? So what we're going to do is we'll just take this project charter and give it more details and specifications, right? And then it will become this. See, this isn't a very easy task in real life. I mean, collecting requirements supposedly is the easiest part, but the difficult part is maintaining your sanity. Because the moment you start gathering requirements, you know, then everybody is going to want to have the best of everything without consideration for budget, quality, or schedule. And they'll have contradicting requirements within themselves, right? There'll be clashes. And especially at this stage, you don't even know the budget or the quality or schedule it. I mean, you have a rough idea, but you don't know the details. So you kind of gather the requirements based on your assumptions. And that's no easy task, right? If my wife comes up to me and says, hey, let's buy you a new car, it's time, you know? She asks, what car do you want? Um, I'm gonna say, I want Porsche 911 GT3. You know, I won't consider the family budget or the maintenance expenses. I'll just say what I want. That's how it's in project management as well. When you ask what your stakeholders want, they'll shoot for the moon. They'll want the best. So as a project manager, you have to keep things sort of on the leash and explain people that there are always trade-offs in life. Just a small tip. Um, when you're collecting requirements, there are so many methods available to you, right? I mean, you can do one-on-one -on -one interviews, you can apply Delphi technique, you can do nominal group technique or other methods, all those fancy sounding names. But if you ask me, and if you can, just stick to the good old meeting, you know? Just get everyone in a room or in a teleconference and gather the requirements collectively. If you do interviews one by one, then you'll have a lot of contradicting requirements at your hand, right? Get everyone together, let them argue, let them fight, but at the end, you'll have your requirements set in stone. Next process is defining the scope, right? Like this, it's the scope. What does the scope do? Scope makes you see certain things clearer, but then exclude other things, right? That's exactly what it is in project management as well. So to do our scope, we need a few documents. We need the project charter, and then, where is my charter? Yeah. We need project charter, and then we need the project requirements document, and then any risk assumptions and constraints, whatever you have, uh, that'll all help you define the scope. Now, defining the scope is one of the most important processes because what happens in reality is Weak project managers include everything in the project requirements document, right? Or make it very vague, um, also in the project scope. So as a result, your project plan just becomes an impossible plan to execute because your scope goes into your project plan, right? Um, so if you do a weak job with setting your scope, uh, or if you're really vague, then you're not going to be able to execute it. Try not to go overboard, uh, make things very clear. So your project scope statement should or may uh, include your project scope um, and then your deliverables. I have it over here. Your project justification, your business case, um, and success criteria, right? So. After the project scope, now let me introduce you to a concept called scope baseline. What is this now? Scope baseline is composed of three things. So you have your scope statement, okay? 
then we need word breakdown structure. I'll refer to it as WS from now on. Okay, this is your WS. We're going to do that now. And after that, we're going to need WBS dictionary. And again, we're going to talk about that soon. So, okay, let's move on with WBS. Now, I want to stop you for a second and make an announcement here. You can't afford to misunderstand WBS. It is very important. Whatever project ma management methodology or framework you use, this is essential. Okay? Very, very important. So, if you want to, again, feel free to take another break, go get some fresh air, and come back when you're ready. Good. Before I start creating a WBS, for the board project, let me tell you what it is. The WBS breaks the project down into smaller and more manageable pieces. It's a top-down effort, right? Um, you basically just decompose your deliverables and then we call them work packages. Now, I wanna highlight one more important thing here. If you're strictly following PMI's framework, then work packages have to be things. They can't be actions. They need to be deliverables, things, right? They can be documents or building or things. My vocabulary is uh, failing me here, but I hope you understand. So in practice though, uh, so the things is for PMI, but for everyone else, uh, you can do a hybrid model, right? Um, it can be work packages and then activities and anything. So whatever suits your need. Okay, so how deep you go? I mean, like how many layers do you want to go? Here is the question. Can you answer this question? Can you confidently estimate the cost and time requirements of that work package? Can you say it'll take one week or a thousand dollars? Can you answer that question? Because if you can't, then you need to break it down further to activity level until you can make some cost and time assumptions. For example, when I look at this boat, um, I can't say how long it will take me to finish it, but I can estimate how long it will take to laminate it or do the woodwork, do the frames. So go as deep as you need to go and then you're going to roll up and estimate the cost and the time, but that's for later. So let's do it. Let's do the WBS. So you start with a project name as level one, and then you segment your project into various work components. So in my case, my segments are, I have design, I have manufacturing, I have electronics, um, then I have the, the rigging, the rig. Rigging is the, the mass sails and the shrouds and the whole thing. Uh, and then I have testing. So and then we need to put labels on them, you know, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. Um, now, this is still too high level, right? I mean, when I look at the graph at that stage, can I estimate the cost and schedule? No, probably not. This means we now need to break it down further. Now, for this project, uh, a project this small, I don't need sub-segments, but Keep in mind that in your project, you may need to put in sub-segments to break it down even more clearly. Now, okay, let me start attaching my work packages. These are the important bits. My work packages are, so I need to find an actual Emoka 60 design. Um, and then what else? After that, I need to adjust the design for scaling down because you can't just take a design for a 20 meter boat and then manufacture a 1.5 meter version of it. So it won't sail well, uh, it won't float well. Uh, so that means I need to increase the volume. Then after that, I need to finalize the design. And this is actually where I actually design it or modify the design I have. So this is actually um, where I make it ready for manufacturing, right? So for manufacturing, my work packages are, um, I need to decide on the materials and then I need to procure them. Then I need the frames. I need frame for the deck and the hull. Um, then, yeah, 
So what else? I'm confused. Yeah, then I need to laminate it. I need to again laminate the hull and the deck. Um, and then I need to assemble them together. You know, the hull part and the deck. Then later on the cosmetics. So for cosmetics, I need to do a lot of sending, you know. Uh, and after sending, I will do the painting. And yeah, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. And as per the electronics, first packages, again, decide on the components and procure them. I'd like to merge them under one work package so I can easily estimate the cost and time investment at this level. I don't need to break it down further. And then the second work package is assembly. Then move on to uh, rigging. The rigging is, again, as I said, the mast, the boom, the, the sails and the lines and shrouds, everything, you know. So for that, again, I need to decide on the, uh, the items and then I need to procure them. Um, and then I need to install them, assemble them. Yeah. And finally, the last one is testing. So I need to do the testing for the uh, electronics, the rigging and the hull. Um, and then I need to do a pool trial and finally sea trial. Okay, now we finished creating our WBS. Now I want to talk about the importance of this document uh, once more. See, everything happens after uh, WBS. The in the planning process, for example, you know the cost, schedule, risks. Everything is calculated by using this chart. We do not calculate the cost or the schedule for a project as a whole. We do that at work package level using the WBS. Now, before we move on to the other processes, uh, I want to remind you of something, something that I mentioned earlier. Do you remember the scope baseline? Hmm? Do you remember what it was consisted of? Let me just remind you once more. It's the project scope, uh, WBS, and WBS dictionary. So now we covered the first two, right? Now it's time for the third one, uh, WBS dictionary. And once we have it now, then the project scope baseline is completed. Okay, so what is this dictionary thingy? Let me just find it as well. So imagine this, if we don't define these work packages in WBS properly, then we are prone to a scope creep. Now, what is scope creep? Scope creep is basically scope extending its boundaries. Remember the Porsche 911 GT3 that I wanted from my wife? So that Porsche 911 GT3 becomes GT3 RS, basically a higher model. So if you don't control and keep the leash of scope, uh, then it keeps on getting expanded and expanded, right? Um, your stakeholders are going to want to stretch its limits. And to prevent it, what you do is you create a dictionary for every single WBS item. What does that mean? You know, like what are the, the boundaries of it? What do you mean by work package? whole framed right so you put boundaries around around it you you explain it by that way nobody can stretch it okay for those of you uh, who are preparing for a PMP test or a CAPM text uh, test uh, you'll know that there are a few other knowledge areas like human resources and communications and risk management procurement and a couple others so I'm not going to cover them here for a few reasons one, I don't think they need explanation. Uh, most of them are fairly easy to understand once you read the read the pin buck. Um, they're very intuitive. You don't need me to teach you about procurement or human resources. The only exception, in my opinion, is risk management. See, that's not very easy. Uh, but I won't talk about risk management here because I will probably have a dedicated video on that later, uh, maybe next month. Uh, and I don't want to spend an hour running risk management simulations here, you know, the Monte Carlo and things. So, plus for most of you, uh, like 99% of you running small projects, you don't factor in risk management anyways. I mean, you're aware of the risks, but you don't go out of your way to spend a week on preparing risk registers, right? Um, so instead, I'll focus on, in my opinion, more essential ones here. So, let's continue with time management, the schedule. And what we do is we start giving estimates for how long 
a particular work package will take. Here's an important point for you. If you can't confidently estimate how long a particular work package will take to complete, then you need to do what? You need to break it down further, right? So let's pick one. Materials decided as part of manufacturing. Okay, do I know how long it takes? Yeah, I, pro yeah, I know it. So I don't need to break it down further. And once you're done estimating these, the other fun part starts, and that's putting them in a sequence. Now, for PMP takers, you need to resort to PMBOK guide for boring details of finish to start, start to finish, and calculations of uh, critical path. Um, for all of you, for, for, the, for the rest of you, you don't need to, because uh, I'm going to show you a lot easier way. So in practice, we do all of those with the help of MS Projects. MS Projects is very easy and it's an awesome, awesome uh, program. But you don't even need MS Projects for most of your projects. All you need at this stage is a Gantt chart, a Gantt chart, however you say it. So Gantt chart is, is very easy to use. It makes things so simple. And um, it's very easy to list your activities or work packages in a suitable time scale. You know, each work package or activity is represented by a bar uh, that shows us the start date, the duration, the length of it is a duration, and the end date of the activity. So it's very simple. You can use MS Projects, you can use MS Excel, or even manually on a PowerPoint if you want to. So it really depends on how complex your project is, right? So for me, uh, and probably for you too, all you need is just um, just a PowerPoint. Uh, you don't even need Excel. Uh, you don't need to run calculations or anything. Just manually do it on PowerPoint. And that's how I'm going to do uh, demonstrating how I did it for you, if I could speak. So, okay, so if you're still with me by this point, uh, please consider subscribing to my channel, because as I said, if you don't, YouTube will not show my future videos to you. In fact, uh, you can even hit that bell icon so you'll be immediately notified of my future releases. Oh, you can also download all the templates I use in this mini course from the link down in the description. You may need to register though. Um, I'm not sure I haven't figured out how to do it yet. So, sorry I digress. Let's get back to the topic. If you subscribed already, uh, let me now talk about three things very quickly, that you'll hear a lot. One, fast tracking. See, fast tracking a project means performing more activities in parallel. So you see more bars along the same vertical axis, right? The other term you hear a lot is called project crashing. Crashing in simple terms is shortening the duration of the activities by adding more resources. For example, if two workers finish the project in 30 days, and how long does it take for four workers to finish it? Obviously 15, and if you said 60, please go get some fresh air. You need a break. Um, so this is called project crashing, but it comes at a cost, right? Cost of additional resources, additional money. So you've, have you seen those, um, you know, um, uh, huge towers being built in China in 30 days, right? You can, you can see their footage, they're amazing. This is what they do, they, they just crash every single work package because they don't have a labor shortage and probably no money shortage either so that's how they do it now let's move on with the costs we're done with the schedule all right cost management now for this piece we'll take out our beloved wbs again but instead of putting durations now we'll give our cost assumptions fairly simple right so we'll do a bottom-up estimating and then start giving up, not giving, start giving uh, our cost assumptions for each work package. Again, very similar to what we did for schedule management. And once you have all the costs added up, for this you may need to use Excel, um, so you can use the easy calculations. PowerPoint won't do, won't do fine here. So anyway, once you have all the costs added up, the direct costs, indirect costs, variable and fixed costs if you want to, uh, then you can create a budget. For those PMP takers, keep in mind that there are a few more steps for you. For example, 
You need your risk register and risk contingencies to be included in your budget. Not just that, actually. You also need your uh, management reserves. So the way it works is you roll up, right? Get your cost estimates for activities, if you included activities, then work packages, right? Then you'll have a rough idea of the project cost estimate, okay? And once you have it, you include the contingency estimates, which comes from your risk studies. You include that, right? And that gives you your cost baseline. Then you include the management reserves and voila, you have your cost budget. That's pretty much it. And as I said, for 99% of us, we don't really do that in practice. We roll up the cost of each work package and then put a 20% contingency reserve and we're done. So no need to complicate anything that we don't have to. You know, we're done with planning. All right, so, so far we're done with the initiation. We're done with planning and now it's the fun part, the execution, you know? It's the doing part. It's where we execute things. It's the fun part. Now let's do it. The purpose of the executing process is to complete the work we defined in project management plan. You know, meet the objectives. This is where we do the work. Your focus now is, as a project manager, I'm assuming you take the project manager role, uh, is to manage your team, follow processes, you know, conflict resolution. Your job is essentially guiding the team to stick to the plan you created with your team. So uh, if you've done a good job with planning, then your execution is going to be so easy. Although it takes the longest, but it's just like playing with Legos. You just put them in their places. But if you haven't done a good job with the planning, then your execution is going to be a nightmare. So in execution, if you're not the one doing all the execution work, like myself in this case, I'm the one who's doing it, you need to constantly manage the expectations of, of, of stakeholders. You need to protect your scope, right? I talked about the importance of this before, because you'll quickly realize that the stakeholders will want you to gold plate. Do you know what that is, the gold plating? So it's in, in simple terms, making changes to a project that are outside of your scope. You know, instead of getting the grade B quality material, as you agreed, your stakeholders now want you to get grade A quality. Now, this is a problem because you didn't, you didn't factor that in your budget or time estimates. So, as a project manager, you need to prevent scope creep. Protect your scope. Your scope is like your, your national flag, you know? You protect it against all unnecessary change requests. You resist. Um, if they're really, really legitimate ones, you can evaluate it and put it in consider consideration uh, if it's really valid with a change request, but don't just take it as is. Don't say, okay, no problem. For those uh, PMP takers or CAPM takers, pay attention to um, change requests and how it's done. Now, this was the execution. The next process group is called monitoring and controlling process group. Monitoring and controlling means measuring the performance of your project against the plan, managing your change requests and making sure you're hitting your KPIs uh, if you have included them in the first place. An important aspect here, uh, monitoring and controlling starts with the execution process group. So they run in parallel. So you monitor and control when you're already executing it. I mean, it makes sense, right? How can you monitor once you finish the execution? It's, it's common sense. So uh, then what do you monitor and control then, right? So you monitor your scope. You make sure no scope creep happens. You monitor your schedule and forecast if you think there'll be delays. Uh, this is particularly easy to see because you already have your uh, project time plan, your project schedule. Remember, we even put it on the gun chart, right? then you monitor your costs, your quality, your risks, and your procurement. Is procurement happening all right? Are the contractors happy? So this is fairly simple. For example, you finished a particular work package, right? Um, and then you can just always look back and verify if you were within the allowance. I mean, if you weren't, then you look for the root causes. What happened? Why did we exceed the budget or the schedule? 
then obviously you solve those problems so they won't repeat. And you make sure you document everything. For PMP takers, please pay extra attention to um, earned value calculations here. It becomes particularly important in this stage. Um, now I want to quickly touch on earned value. So earned value is the total project budget multiplied by the percentage complete of the project. For example, you have budgeted $1 million for the whole project, let's say, okay? And you have finished 20% of it. So your earned value is $200,000. Now, this is primarily used for construction and software projects and an important concept by PMI, right? But in real life, it doesn't hold much value other than few industries like the construction and the IT. And the reason is the value gained cannot always be assessed along the progression of the project. What does this even mean? It means it's not always a linear progression. Most of the time, the actual value of a project goes like this. So it's not linear, it's a power curve. Most projects show exponential growth instead of a linear one. And they get compounded results every month. And their calculation is a lot more difficult than a simple y equals to mx plus b. To calculate it, you need a growth decay formula. So it's, it's a very complex one. And no project manager is going to run that every week just to calculate the earned value. This one is uh, very similar to how we calculate interests, uh, compound interests. So, okay, before I bore you to death, uh, let's move to closing process group. Actually, no. I want to explain this just a bit more, uh, the exponential growth theory, because I believe you'll benefit from it. So let's take my YouTube channel, for example. Let's call this project Project 100,000 subscribers. That's what I love to achieve. At the moment, I have about 19,000 subscribers. So let's say I get 500 subscribers per week with 20 videos, right? Total 20 videos. So if I have 40 videos, provided that I maintain the quality, I will not have 1,000 subscribers per week. It'll probably be 2,000 per week or a lot more because it gets compounded, right? Just like your money in your savings account. See, if you calculate your earned value based on your execution, uh, then you'll get confused. I mean, think of it this way. I'm still putting out about one video per week, right? But it all of a sudden just became exponential, right? So that's how most projects are in real life. Okay, sorry to, to have taken your time. Um, I digress a little bit there. So the key takeaway is whatever your project is, don't quit just because you don't see the results now. They will come. And when they do, they will come like that. Okay, let's do closing. Let's close this project. Now, we finished the product, right? The end result. We have the boat. It's completely finished. But is the project finished? I mean, the product is finished, but the project? No. It's not, not yet. There's still some work to be done, not much, but we still have to do certain things uh, and mostly boring admin work. So what do we do now? Well, what you do is, um, well, it's actually really customizable to the needs and complexity of your project. But in general, um, what I'm going to share with you are good starting points. One, we handed over the end product to the client. If it's a project you did for a client, right? You need to basically get a sign off from the client that says, okay, I received the possession of this item, you know, and then they sign it off. And then you finish procurements, meaning you need to make the final payments and complete your cost records. And then you need to gather your final lessons learned. This is basically documenting, documenting what went wrong and what did we learn from it? I mean, you probably can't see it when I show the boat, but um, this boat isn't perfect. The bow of the boat is actually not straight. It's, it's leaning towards the port side, the left side. So yeah, a few lessons learned there. And then uh, the four uh, item to do is uh, you release resources. Let your team members go back to their own teams. And then finally, you go celebrate. Congratulations. 
Thanks for being with me the past one hour. I hope you benefited from this video. And if you did, please share it with your friends and professional network in LinkedIn. And if you share it in LinkedIn, please feel free to send me an invitation to connect. I'd love to connect with you. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, if you are looking to make a big jump in your career and explore working for multinational companies, consider joining my LIG program. That's where I share some of the advanced strategies to getting yourself employed by uh, amazing multinational firms. It delivers great results. And um, all right, we're done. See you next week.